Welcome to the Radiology Vault, an open repository for radiology educational content designed for learners and medical professionals. Presented by the Michigan Medicine Department of Radiology. Hello, my name is Samar Susan, and I am a musculoskeletal radiologist at the University of Michigan. Today, we will be talking about MRI imaging in adhesive capsulitis. I have no relevant disclosures. Here is a brief outline of the presentation. First, we will discuss a brief introduction, and then we will delve into the diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis on MRI, followed by some example cases, and then a very brief discussion on treatment options for adhesive capsulitis. And lastly, we will wrap up with the conclusions. Adhesive capsulitis, colloquially known as frozen shoulder, is a disease of progressive shoulder pain with gradual loss of active and passive range of motion. Multiple risk factors, including but not limited to obesity, diabetes, thyroid disease, and cardiovascular disease can contribute to adhesive capsulitis. Given the prevalence of some of these conditions, adhesive capsulitis is a common but underdiagnosed condition. Natural disease course of adhesive capsulitis may last between one to three years and can be subcategorized into four different phases. The first phase, which is known as pre-freezing or called phase one, can include shoulder pain, which is particularly bad at night. The second phase, or freezing, is typically lasting between 10 to 36 weeks and can be an insidious process onset characterized by continued pain and progressive stiffness. The third phase, or what is known as frozen, uh, typically lasts between 4 to 12 months and is characterized by a gradual decrease in pain but accompanied by continued loss of active and passive range of motion. The final phase, which is thawing, or phase 4, can last anywhere between 5 and 26 months and describes the gradual and spontaneous improvement of shoulder mobility and function. Now we will discuss the diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis is diagnosed clinically by patient history of gradual onset of shoulder pain and physical examination findings of limited ability to perform both active and passive range of motion, particularly with external rotation and forward flexion. However, MRI is increasingly being utilized to support a clinical suspicion of adhesive capsulitis and has been found to correlate with intraoperative findings. In the subsequent slides, we will show a few different imaging features of adhesive capsulitis on MRI, followed by some example cases. One area to look at on the shoulder MRI is to investigate the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the axillary recess. If you see edema and or thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the axillary recess, this can be suggestive of adhesive capsulitis. Note that this is a more specific sign of adhesive capsulitis compared to some of the other MRI features, which we will discuss subsequently. Here, we have a coronal T2 fat saturated image demonstrating thickening, indistinctness, and edema of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the axillary recess as annotated by the arrow. The coracohumeral ligament is another region to investigate in shoulder MRI to assess for adhesive capsulitis. So if you notice edema, thickening, and or indistinctness of the coracohumeral ligament, this can also be seen with adhesive capsulitis. Here on the right-hand side, we have a sagittal T1 image demonstrating thickening of the coracohumeral ligament, again as annotated by the arrow here. The rotator interval is another region that can be involved with adhesive capsulitis. The rotator interval is the space bound by the supraspinatus tendon posture superiorly, the subscapularis tendon anteroinferiorly, and the coracoid process medially. Edema and or fatty obliteration of the rotator interval can be seen with adhesive capsulitis. On the right hand side, we have a sagittal T2 fat saturated image of the shoulder which demonstrates edema within the rotator interval as seen here in the circle. Here is an example case 
of marked thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and axillary recess. This particular case is significantly profound, and in most cases, you will not see the IGHL be this thickened. It's important to note that you don't need to have the constellation of thickening, edema, and indistinctness. Any one of these signs can be present with adhesive capsulitis. Again, the signal and morphologic changes in following the inferior glenohumeral ligament and axillary recess has been shown to be the most specific sign for adhesive capsulitis on MRI. This is another example case which shows obliteration of the rotator interval fat as seen here by the circled area. It's important to note that you don't need to have complete fatty obliteration of the rotator interval fat. However, a partially obliterated region of fat within the rotator interval may be enough to suggest adhesive capsulitis if there is a clinical suspicion for it. In this case, we have obliteration of the rotator fat interval and thickening of the coracohumeral ligament. The arrow denotes thickening and indistinctness of the coracohumeral ligament, and the circled area denotes a region of fatty obliteration of the rotator interval. This is another example case also demonstrating thickening of the coracohumeral ligament as seen here. This example case demonstrates thickness, indistinctness, and edema in the coracohumeral ligament as seen on the sagittal T2 fat saturated sequence of the shoulder. In this case, we have thickening and edema of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and axillary recess. Compared to the first example case, this is a more common presentation where you do have some thickening and indistinctness and some edema, but not as profound thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and axillary recess. Now we will briefly discuss the treatment course for adhesive capsulitis. Most patients do not seek medical evaluation until weeks or months after symptoms arise, given the gradual progression of the disease. Conservative treatment modalities should be attempted for at least six months and include corticosteroid injections, intensive physical therapy, and manual mobilization. More invasive therapeutic procedures can be attempted after six months of failed conservative treatment and include hydrodilation, nerve blockade, closed manipulation, and capsular release surgery if pain and stiffness do not subside. In conclusion, Adhesive capsulitis is a clinical diagnosis. However, MRI is being increasingly utilized to support a suspected diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. MRI also plays a primary role in suggesting adhesive capsulitis in the differential in cases in which it was not initially suspected, which can impact management. The main MRI features of adhesive capsulitis includes thickening, edema, and or indistinctness of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and axillary recess, and remember that this is the most specific imaging feature for adhesive capsulitis. Edema and or fatty obliteration of the rotator interval can also be seen, and thickening edema and or indistinctness of the coracohumeral ligament can also be seen with adhesive capsulitis. It is important to note that seeing these imaging features on shoulder MRI, although can suggest adhesive capsulitis, is not necessarily diagnostic of adhesive capsulitis, and may simply be present due to other medical conditions affecting the shoulder. Here are my references. Thank you everyone for listening to my presentation on MRI imaging features of adhesive capsulitis.